So there was this guy named Gold Roger and he left a bunch of treasure when he died. After that, they meet a talking reindeer who's actually a doctor. But then, a giant bear man sends Luffy to an island of Amazonian women. So, an evil ghost scientist accidentally turns the son of a samurai into a dragon. Then, the Straw Hats become world famous after crashing a wedding. And that's how Luffy becomes King of the Pirates! I think we finally made it. I think this is the first genuinely across the board good arc of One Piece. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would say this is the arc that most people say that really gets you into One Piece. This is the one. I agree, and like it really sets up a lot of the things that we expect to see throughout One Piece. Sad backstories, we get the cool team up fights and like pair offs, and like we actually get like a real template for what will come. And I think that that's fitting because like it feels like Oda put a lot of effort into this arc because there's a lot to get, talk about, and we're gonna just dive straight into it because we're gonna be here all night if we don't start. So, coming off the end of the last arc, Nami stole the Going Mary as well as a bunch of treasure from. Uh, Luffy's crew and Johnny and Yasaku and is currently heading towards somewhere that they don't exactly know where though they think they have a hint and Usopp and Johnny are following behind her in their boat. Oh, I'm sorry, Zoro's with them too. And then Luffy, Sanji, and Yosaku are traveling in another boat behind them. So they're all kind of in three waves. And so we first see Luffy and his crew. And so as Luffy, Sanji, and Yosaku are sailing, he mentions this interesting thing I want to like just briefly touch on, which is that Zeph calls the Grand Line Paradise. Which, it turns into an argument because Yosaku berates Luffy and Sanji for not taking the Grand Line seriously, and he mentions that the, the Grand Line is governed by three great powers, and one of those powers are the Seven Warlords of the Sea, which are basically privateers in our world. They're a little different. They mention here that the warlords give the government a cut of their treasure, and then they're like that's kind of like how they allow them to operate. So they suspend their bounties, and they let them just kind of exist out in the world with like no problems. And we actually just met a warlord last arc, which is Mihawk. Mihawk is the first warlord that we meet, and it's important that we understand the warlord system because there's another warlord who we have not met, but Yusaku mentions his name is Jinbei. He's a fishman, which is the first instance we've heard of a fishman. And they think Nami is headed towards Arlong Park, where Arlong is, and Arlong is another fishman who in his prime was considered to be Jinbei's equal. So by like power translation, we can sort of assume that at least at this point, what we're setting up is that Arlong is like on a vague power level near Mihawk, <laughs> which is- Which is insane this early in the series, but- I, for a long time, I honestly got thought Arlong was a warlord because I misunderstood this interaction. That's not the case. Arlong is not a warlord. He's also not as strong as Mihawk, but we'll, we'll get to that point. But didn't Jinbei make a deal? Yeah, so Arlong was jailed, and Jinbei, as part of his acceptance into the Seven Warlords, made a deal with the world government to release Arlong from jail. It's sort of like a peace brokering deal between humans and fishmen, because as we'll learn through this arc, relations between fishmen and humans are not very good. So not this will be a theme all. throughout the entirety of One Piece. I'm like, no joke, to this day, it is an issue, and we will see this come up again and again. So Yusaku explains that they think Nami is headed over towards Arlong Park because when they were on their ship, they saw her looking at his wanted poster for 20 million berries right before uh, she kicked him and Johnny off the boat. This is the first confirmation of a bounty that we've seen since Haguma, which is interesting. We'll learn Buggies was 15, Kuro's is 16, and Don Kriegs was 17. So they're kind of all in that same range together, and Arlong is a little bit above them at 20 million, and he has extremely high bounty for this area. Speaking of Arlong, we cut to him. Uh, we see him sitting down, and he is a sawtooth shark fishman. So all fishmen are based on a real-life aquatic animal, and his is a sawtooth shark. He has really sharp teeth and a, a long sawtooth nose. It's kind of like Usopp's, but it's 
And so we see him and his first mate, Hachan, who's an octopus fisherman, and he's kind of like a ditzy, like dumb kind of guy, but he's very loyal to Arlong, and Arlong is currently bribing the marine captain, Nozumi, who looks like a rat, because he kind of is a rat. He is a rat. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting to point out here, when Hachan, so when they finish doing their little bribing deal, Hachan escorts Nozumi back to the ship, and Nozumi thinks to himself, these fishmen are a creepy lot, which is like the first time that we see this real idea of discrimination against fishmen. And it's, it's really like not treated as like a big deal, especially because these guys are <laughs> kind of mean throughout this arc. So it feels weird to think of them as like anything but creepy and mean. But as we'll see throughout the series, humans kind of just hate fishmen broadly. So at the same time as this, as Nozomi is leaving, Nami arrives to Arlong Park. So they were right. Uh, Nami is going to Arlong Park. And this young boy runs up with a small sword. He threatens to kill Arlong for murdering his father. But Nami takes a moment, pauses, and then hits a child in the head, telling him, Arlong doesn't have time for some snot-nosed kid. So this is kind of like a shocker because at this point we're thinking she's going after Arlong for his bounty because he has such a huge bounty she wants to treasure. But she is not going against him. She is somehow with him. And we actually see on her left, kind of like behind her shoulder, is a tattoo of the Arlong Jolly Roger. So she is definitely with them, which is confirmed pretty much immediately afterwards because when she enters Arlong Park, she is greeted sarcastically, but also pretty warmly by Arlong who says, uh, one of my officers is back, time to throw a feast. So was all the shit she was saying for the last 60 chapters about hating pirates just bullshit because she is one. She is a pirate. Un unquestionably, she is a pirate. While this, they're doing this, Johnny, Zoro, and Usopp, they approach Arlong Park. They notice that Nami has actually anchored the Going Merry at Coco Village, which is a nearby town. And when they try to investigate it, Usopp notices that there are several fishmen at the dock. And at this point, Johnny realizes, oh my god, these are Arlong's men and this town is being controlled by Arlong and that they try to board the ship. Usopp dive overboard. They leave Zoro behind who they have just tied up because they didn't want him to overexert himself and tear open his wounds again that he just got his last fight with Mihawk. And so he just gets captured and taken by Arlong's men. They take him back to Arlong Park. Johnny says here that fishmen are 10 times stronger than humans, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, so Johnny and, and Usopp go to the nearest town, which is Gosa Village, which is where that kid from earlier was from. And we see all of the houses are flipped upside down. And Johnny explains that Arlong went on a rampage a few weeks ago here, and that because of his immense strength, like that 10 times strength that you said, he and his crew literally tore up the entire town and killed most of everybody. So when they get to the shore, there is a fisherman like chasing after Johnny and Usopp. Johnny runs away, Usopp kind of gets left behind, and Usopp gets stopped by this kid that we saw earlier, who we find out his name is Chabo, and he mistakes Usopp for a fisherman because of his long nose and tries to attack him, but he is stopped by Nojiko, a woman from Coco Village, which is the town that Nami docked in. After they resolve this misunderstanding, the fisherman that was chasing them decides to attack Usopp, but before he can stand up to them, Nojiko tells him not, not to touch the fisherman and knocks Usopp out, but she brings him to her house on the outskirts of Coco Village. And when he wakes up, she explains that uh, she just saved his life and that if he had attacked the fisherman, things would have been gone very poorly for everyone involved. And so she also then tells, like, she chides the kid for also trying to attack the fishman, because he's also there, um, and basically says that he tried to throw away his life and that not only did she help him, but the woman at Arlong Park, who the kid calls a witch, also saved his life and that you should not mess with these fishmen, that they're way too powerful and that they will destroy you. Usopp says that she's being a little too harsh, but Najiko's like very passionate and says that she hates seeing people throw away their lives because she once knew a kid who faced a life worse than death and chose to live anyway. And so she does not tolerate people throwing away their lives. Kind of like what Luffy says, and the Barate, uh, the, the Bra oh my god, this is still Baratie. Baratie, the Baratie yeah. arc to Sanji, where he says throwing away your life is not a way to live up to your promises. So then she sends Chubb away to his mother because his mother's still alive, and then Usopp tells her he's looking for a woman named Nami, and Ojiko pretty casually just says, oh yeah, Nami's part of Arlong's crew, and also that's my sister. It's her stepsister. And this like makes Usopp pretty angry because he feels really betrayed and lied to, perceiving like Nami's kindness and friendship as a ruse. But Jiko simply says to him, really? She was friendly? We know this dramatic irony that we saw in the last uh, arc that Nami was very upset having to separate herself 
from the Straw Hats. And the crew obviously doesn't know that because they weren't there. We as the audience know that. And now we're getting even more confirmation that Nami is acting really out of character around these people. Um, so they're clearly very important to her. So then Usopp finally, finally remembers after all this time that Zoro was captured by the Arlong pirates. And when we cut back to Zoro, he is now tied up and captured. He tells Arlong that he's looking for a woman and he calls Arlong a dirty half fish. I thought this was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, yeah. Zoro's not dodging the allegations. And also Arlong here mentions that fishmen are evolved humans who have the ability to breathe underwater. Arlong says that a human fighting fishman is fighting the power of nature itself. And so Arlong is very much like a fishman supremacist in this way. We'll learn later on that it's, it's somewhat justified in the sense that like, as we said before, people really hate fishmen. And so Arlong, it seems because it's the first time that we really meet fishmen that Arlong is using his power to terrorize like innocent victims like bullies which he is arlong is a bad dude however it's more it's a broader issue than just like arlong being a bully should i say it you yes you yeah i'm not saying it fishmen are black people <laughs> later on we, we will see we will see fishmen uh fishman malcolm x and fishman martin luther king jr yep not even but joking. That's a story for another time. Uh, so he's not <laughs> joking here. I also want to point out here that Arlong is very much like Magneto. If Magneto was outright a villain, he is very much proposing that like, uh, I forget what Magneto calls the X-Men in the comics, but it's like, uh, oh, uh, Homo Superior, right? Like they're, they're the next level of human evolution. And so like Arlong kind of resembles that in a way. And so he kind of justifies ruling over these people by the, the idea that like he is stronger than they are. So after the spiel from Arlong, uh, Nami shows up and Arlong refers to her as his surveyor, which really angers Zoro, because again, he's thought this whole time that she's hated pirates. When Arlong's going through this whole spiel about how fishermen are superior, when Nami comes in, she remarks that she hates his this whole theory of his, and Arlong's like, nah, you're one of the good humans, like, the rest of them are trash, but you're good. <laughs> yeah, they have this very adversarial relationship, um, and yeah, like, he seems to make this one exception for, for Nami. Arlong then asks Nami if he if she knows Zoro, but she says, not only know him, but I did steal his treasure, and he's upset about that, and that's why he chased me here. So Arlong laughs at Zoro, saying that uh, Nami is an expert at trickery and treasure stealing, um, and that she is a, quote, cold-blooded witch woman that even forgave the death of a parent for money. But this comment very much distresses Nami, and so she has her back towards Arlong, and Zoro sees her face and how much that comment upset her, and Zoro's like, this is weird. So then Nami tells him to leave now that he knows the truth, but he jumps back into the water, even though he's tied up, which is like, he's just going to drown. But Nami freaks out and she rescues him and pulls him out of the water. Uh, he says, what kind of cold-blooded witch woman can't stand to see a man drown? And Nami replies, you jerk, if you mess with me again, you're dead. Then Nami tells them to throw Zoro in jail and should deal with him. And so they do that, but the fisherman from earlier runs in and tells Arlong that Usopp got away and he's hiding in Coco Village, causing Arlong to reveal that he'll deal with that since he has business there anyway. And also now Zoro knows that Usopp is here and he is in Coco Village. When Arlong arrives in Coco Village, he lives immediately after he says this, he confronts a man named Ginzo, who is the town leader, kind of looks like, kind of looks like a beat cop from like the 40s or 50s, brown shirt, hat, and he also has a pinwell on his hat. He also has stitches all over his body. Yes, which are not a fun character design. We'll get to that at some point. But he also has a bunch of swords, apparently, which is an allegation that Arlong levies against him. And Arlong says that owning weapons gives birth to wicked thoughts and violence. And he essentially is arguing that having these weapons is sedition and that he is threatening to rise up against Arlong. And the punishment for sedition is death. This is also the first time we get to see Arlong standing up, especially against another human. His canonical height is 8'7", I'm pretty sure. And so he is like a monster towering over these regular people. My boy is in the wrong profession. He should be in the NBA. Like, what's he doing <laughs> out here? <laughs> so then this is like happening. Najiko is sort of explaining this to Usopp that all the villages under Arlong's control pay him tribute every month. And that if even one person can't pay the tribute, he'll destroy the entire town, 
which is what he did to Gosa. So somebody couldn't pay or refuse to pay, and he tore up the entire town. When we go back to Arlong, because of this perceived seditious behavior, Arlong threatens to kill not only Ginzo, but the entire town of Coco Village, and they kind of get riled up and they go to like threaten to attack Arlong. However, he reminds them that the last eight years they made a vow to fight by enduring, and that if violence breaks out now, all of their progress will be lost. However, Arlong still wants to kill Genzo because, again, seditious shit, and so he goes to kill him as an example, but before he can do that, Usopp shoots Arlong with an exploding star and uses his typical lie of, I have 8,000 men behind me, um, but Arlong trucks it off like nothing happened and even says, I'll fight 80,000 humans, I do not care. Which is again, like, Usopp being scared but not cowardly. He was not going to sit by and let this man get killed. He doesn't know anyone in here except for Nojiko, who he met like 10 minutes ago. He knows how strong these fishmen are, and he still decides to step in and be brave. So Arlong then starts to destroy the building that Usopp is on top of, um, but his crew holds him back and they remind him that like they've already lost the profit from Gosa and that like doing this is just like feeding his ego and like it doesn't it doesn't help them in any way and like they need to keep them all alive because otherwise they just lose a bunch of revenue. However, Arlong then commands his crew to hunt Usopp down. So then after this, Nami shows up in town, but everyone like returns to their home when they see her, they get like, very angry and walk away, except Najiko, which is probably to be understood, like that's her sister. You, you support your siblings even when they do shit you don't like sometimes. So Nami then goes to a grave and Najiko tells her that like the whole village hates you. You know that, right? She's like, yeah, I know. But I have 93 million berries and I only need 7 million more to buy Cocoa Village back from Arlong, which is now confirming what we learned at the end of the last arc is that this is what Nam needs all this treasure for, and this is the village she was talking about. So she ha now has 93 million, and that she only needs 7 million more, and apparently she has some sort of deal with Arlong that once she reaches this, this 100 million berry amount, then he will let Coco Village go. So we, now we cut back to Arlong Park, and Zoro has defeated all of the nameless fishman underlings because before Nami left, she freed him and gave him his sword back. He only has one sword, because the other two broke, if you remember that from last episode. They were shattered by Mihawk, so he only has the one. Um, and he knows that he could just leave now because, like, everyone is is taken out. But uh, Luffy asks him to bring Nami back, um, and so that's what he plans on doing, as well as rescuing Usopp, who he knows is, like, in danger in, in Coco Village. So then he finds Hachan, Arlong's first mate from earlier, the octopus guy, who was not around when they brought Zoro in because he was feeding the fishman Sea Beast. Kind of like Sea Kings from the very first episode, if you remember those. But Sea Beast is a more genericized term. This particular Sea Beast we'll get to in a little bit. It's not so mean looking. Looks like a giant cow, right? It looks friendly. It, it looks it looks friendly until it's not. He convinces Hachan that he is a guest of Arlong's, and he's like, oh, and, and Hachan's like, oh, you're a guest of the captain's? I'll take you over to Cocoa Village. It's like, that's fucking easy. Hell yeah. Hachan is also like one of the nicer fishmen, and it looks like he is very much just loyal to Arlong, not so much that he has a superiority complex that Arlong has. I also want to note something about Hachan's character design, which is that he has a a sun on his forehead. Uh, it's like a tattoo on his forehead. Arlong has one like on his chest, and I think one of the other officers also has one somewhere on his body also. We will not find out what that is until quite a long time, but I just do want to talk about that right now. So while Hachan takes Zoro to Coco Village to find Usopp. Usopp has finally been kit or finally been captured and is taken back to Arlong Park, where he finds out that Zoro's knocked out most of his fishmen. And Arlong's crew, they hypothesize that based on Nami's behavior, like she was super weird, that she brought this pirate hunter Zoro to come take Arlong's head. However, Nami at this moment returns and promises that she is still loyal, to which Arlong says, yeah, 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 we were too hasty, we still trust you, but now it's time to kill Zoro when we find him, and this guy right now, talking about Usopp. This is also where Arlong mentions to Usopp that he has the largest bounty in the East Blue at 20 million, which is true. Up to this point, he has the largest bounty at 20 million. So then another one of Arlong's officers, Kurobi, he, who is a manta ray fishman, he's also like a martial arts, uh, a martial artist, he has like a black belt and stuff. Um, he tells Nami he does not trust her, she's fishy, he does not, <laughs> fishy, um, he does not I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> he does not trust you. her. <laughs> um, he does not trust her. And then also at the same moment, Usopp tells her that she disgusts him. And that even after her betrayal, Luffy still leaves in her. And But Nami calls him stupid and says it's not really her problem that he's so stupid and trusting. So then Hachin finally comes back. He's angry that someone knocked out his crew. 
um, only to accidentally reveal that he helped the guy who did it because he didn't know that that was the same guy. He's too trusting. He is. Yeah. He is very sweet. I actually really like Hachan. Octopodes are my favorite animal, which also I think adds to this. I really love Hachan. I think he's such a cool character. So Nami thinks fast and realizes that she's like about to be killed if Arlong sort of realizes that she despises him and that like Usopp and Zoro showing up is like really messed up her plan. She thinks fast and she attacks Usopp to show her loyalty to Arlong. Usopp throws a smoke star, hoping to escape into the water, but Nami predicts this and bashes him over the head. But then she pulls out a knife and goes to stab him, but she puts her own hand in front of his gut, stabbing herself. And she leans in and tells him, this is only business, nothing else. Usopp falls back into the water and they think he's dead and they're like, I'm sorry, I misjudged you, I definitely trust you. And Kirby says, I'm glad that you're on our team. And she says, I'm not on your team. Do not forget that. I am here to buy back Coco Village. And that is it. I, once I'm done with that, I am leaving. So apparently it seems that part of the deal, in addition to freeing Coco Village, is letting her go. However, Kirby, who does not trust her, he reveals that he broke into her room and stole an old map she made of Coco Village with a giant X on it. For buried treasure presumably but Arlong tells him to give it back to her um, and that he would rather die than break his promise to her. Now we return to Luffy, Sanji, and Yusako for the first time since the beginning of this this arc and they are slowly sailing towards Arlong Park when they come across this giant sea beast Momu who is this cow sea beast we were talking about. He's like green and white. He's like a, he's like a cow fish. He's really cute. Hachin was trying to feed him earlier, but he wouldn't show up. So he's very hungry. So Sanji tries to feed him, but then Momu tries to eat Sanji. And so like Sanji and Luffy just beat the shit out of Momu and they make him the steed of their boat and make him like run as fast or swim as fast as he possibly can towards Arlong Park. He's Clark. crying. He's got huge <laughs> knots on his head. He's not having a good time. So he swims incredibly fast towards Arlong Park, but then he slams into like the island wall and he launches the boat that they borrowed from, from the Baratier quite a long way, like into Coco Village. The boat is gone. It, it does not survive this. When they crash into Zoro, who, when he got to Coco Village, he spoke to a villager and they told him that, yeah, that, that long nosed guy got taken back to Arlong Park. So he's trying to make his way back to Arlong Park. Um, even though he just got to Coco Village, which is a very funny play on the like Zoro gets lost trope. So Zoro gives them the quick breakdown on all of this stuff that just happened while they were gone. And as he says that they need to find Usopp, Johnny shows up for the first time in like 12 chapters. I've not seen this man in quite a long time. He shows up and he tells them that he saw Nami kill Usopp, which shocks the entire Straw Hat crew. Luffy tells him very angrily to take back what he said about Nami because uh, that's his shipmate and she would never do that. Um, however, right as he says that, Nami shows up and tells him that she's done with him and to take the Going Merry and leave because he's no match for Arlong and the Fishmen. However, Luffy, undaunted, he just weighs down and takes a nap, saying he's not scared of any Fishmen. Meanwhile, Usopp is wandering Coco Village, wondering why Nami saved him and like why she said that weird thing about business before he realized that he needs to stop Zoro from going into Arlong Park because Zoro still thinks he's in Arlong Park and so he has to run to the edge of the town where he finds everybody. He finds Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji just kind of chilling. Finally reunited, right? So over on Coco Village, uh, the villagers notice that a marine ship is heading over and Choba, the little kid from earlier, tells them that um, it's here to rescue them, that the elders of the village called in the navy ship and that they're coming to, to save them from the fishmen. Arlong also notices that this boat is coming and Arlong's like, well, don't let him do any funny business. Just go ahead and bribe him, like get his two million from him. However, this boat, led by Commodore Purin Purin, attacks Arlong with a cannonball, and Arlong catches it in his mouth and crushes it by like chomping on it. Just bites that shit out the air, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. So Arlong's officers, Hachin, Kurobi, and then a new guy named Chu, um, they offer to go fight the ship, and they uh, quickly dispatch the ship with very little effort. They just like tear off the rudder, like punch a hole in the side of it. They like knock out their crewmen, they, they knock out the, the Commodore, very easily take them out. And Najiko comments from afar that this is the reality that they live in. No one can escape Arlong's clutches. Back at Arlong Park, they mention that they need Nami's cartography abilities to maintain Arlong's empire. But if she buys out Coco Village, she'll be free to leave. And this poses an issue for Arlong and his crew. At Najiko's house, Nami is at Najiko's house. And Najiko tells her like, you know, we knew, we shared everything together. You know, why are you hiding stuff from me now? And so she tells them about 
her adventures with the Straw Hats, even calling them shipmates and friends, which Najiko knows that this is the most painful word to her. She does not use that word. She hates using it, um, but she clearly cares very much about the Straw Hats. So Najiko leaves Nami to sleep while she meets with the Straw Hats, tell them about Nami's past if they promise to leave. Essentially, they're going to use this as a bargaining chip to get them to leave because even she realizes that she doesn't want them here. She doesn't think that they can take the Arlong pirates and so she wants to get them out of here. As she does this, Nizumi, the rat-faced man from earlier, he docks into Coco Village and asks Ginzo where Nami is. So while that's happening, Najiko tells the story to Sanji, Usopp, and Zoro. Luffy walked away so he did, he did not want to hear her backstory. He did not care that that was not relevant to him, that he was still going to save her and bring him uh, to his ship anyway. Zoro also falls asleep. I don't think he's asleep. I think he's pretending. I think he is too, because he doesn't seem like surprised by anything. So I think he's yeah. also hears it. This is where we get one of the saddest backstories, I would say, in One Piece. Like, I legitimately was crying. Like, I know we, we kind of, like, joked about the, the Chow Chow thing in episode one, about, like, oh, this is this is upsetting. Like, I was in tears reading this. This is the real sadness right here. So, Najiko tells them that uh, she and Nami grew up very poor on Coco Village, being raised by their foster mother, Bellamere. Eight years ago, she was about 10, and Najiko was about 12. They're two years apart. Nami had shown a uh, keen interest in map making and navigation with her dream, even at this early of an age, being to draw a map of the entire world. And she steals a navigational book from the local bookstore, um, which Genzo paid for, before returning her back to Bellamere. Importantly, Genzo does not have his scars in this flashback eight years ago. Nope. He still has the pinwheel, though. At dinner at that night, Nami realizes that Bellamere isn't eating. Um, because she can't afford to feed all three of them. So she and Najiko refuse to eat. Bellamere, she chides them for that though, and basically says that like kids need to eat. Like, I'm on a diet, I'm eating tangerines that I'm growing in, in the grove. Don't worry about me, I'm fine. She, and she also deflects this by showing Nami a dress that she had been repairing that was a hand-me-down from Najiko. It said like, I'm a lion on it. This is really cute, it's a cute little dress. But Nami is very upset by this because she wants nice clothes, she wants nice things, and she's tired of having these hand-me-down clothes. And she eventually, like, gets into a fight with Njiko where she says, like, we're not really related by blood, so I don't want to be your sister. This really upsets Bellamere, and she slaps Nami and says, why are you saying this? You two are more closely related than anybody by blood. You two are sisters through and through. Never forget that. Nami kind of, like, reveals that she says that she was, she wishes that she was found by rich parents, which sounds like demeaning but then she explains that like if she was then Bellamere wouldn't be starving that like she could actually afford to take care of herself so like even at the age of like 10 years old Nami is like already like such a kind person thinking about her inadvertent impact on people it's, it's very sad it's so sad but she also says she's not you're not my mom <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. She's not too nice. I don't know. She's 10. I don't know. She's... The thing of, like, I wish I was in a different family so you wouldn't suffer is, like, incredibly emotionally intelligent for a 10-year-old, though. Bellamere yells at her and basically says, like, fine, go find a new family. I don't actually care. Like, leave. And Najiko's like, please calm down. Please. Please calm down. Like, you're both out of freaking out. But Nami runs off to Genzo. Um, and Genzo kind of reveals that when Bellamere was Nami's age, she was also uh, a terrorizer of the town, that she basically was exactly like Nami and Najiko were. But she, she went off to the Navy, joined the Marines, and came back one night with these two children. And it really surprised everybody because when she left, she was a troublemaker. And now she here is here like a battle, a battle war hardened woman with these two children. And she makes it clear that like she, and like she's incredibly wounded. But they make the point that like when she arrived, uh, she was wounded and all she cared about was like taking care of these children. Ginzo also says that like the story that she told about finding them under a bridge was a lie and that she was like left for dead in a war zone and she was going to die when Najiko showed up as a three-year-old holding like one-year-old Nami and this this inspired her to take care of them and to live. Because her face she looked at Nami baby Nami and she was smiling in the midst of this giant ass battlefield and she was like I want to keep the smile on this baby's face she doesn't even know that she's in the midst of a war yes exactly it moves her so much that she comes back and she raises them on this island where she is still kind of terrorizes the town a little bit like they have another flashback where some like local boys are like bullying Nami and Najiko and they like 
they like get in trouble with them and then the mom's like it's fine Belmira, it's not a big deal and then Nami's like, yeah, they were talking shit about your tangerines. And she's like, they did what now? And Bellamira starts beating on the child, like not even the mom. <laughs> she starts beating on this child. It's very funny. Also, I should probably mention that the house that they live in is Bellamira's and that to this day, Najiko grows the tangerines Bellamira care for. So as they're wrapping up these stories, Najiko comes to grab Nami for dinner when the Arlong pirates show up. And Genzo tells them to hide in the forest, that this is very dangerous and very serious, and that they need to, like, hide and stay out of this. Arlong rounds everybody up, and he forces them to pay 100,000 berries for each adult and 50,000 berries for each kid, um, and tells his crew to kill the ones that can't pay. Fortunately, when he rounds everyone up in town, they all pay, so nobody is going to die, and they get ready to leave, but Hachan notices that there is smoke coming out of the chimney often to the like far end of town and that there's someone else that they have not spoken to yet. In her home, Bellamere is cooking dinner. She's like splurging a little bit. She's like, it's going to be a really good dinner night because she's like, she's upset with herself for like hurting Nami and she wants to make it up to her. And Ginzo sort of tells Nami and Najiko to hide in the forest and to stay away. And then when they realize Arlong Parts are going to find Bellamere, he then tells them with the doctor that like they need to run away and leave the island permanently because if they find out about them, then they'll be killed because Bellamere doesn't have enough money to pay for all three of them. And so they need to leave and run away. And so they kind of like are thinking to do that. But then when they show up to the, the house, the Arlong pirates are there and they try to like sneak in. But Bellamere like gets upper hand on Arlong because she was a trained marine fighter, but he like shatters her gun by biting it and very quickly takes care of her, like bloodies her immensely. And this is when Ginzo and the doctor show up and they basically say that, you know, just pay him off. Like, what do you have in your savings? And she's like, I have, I have like a hundred thousand saved up. And he's like, good, that's enough for you. Just pay it and he'll, he'll leave. But like Hachan goes into the house and he says, boss, boss, there's three people here. There's three people, like, like there's enough food here for three people. So there's two people that we did not account for. And Ginzo is like, no, 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 no. That's me and the doctor. We are coming over for dinner tonight. There's no one else. It's just us, right, Bellamere? She's like, yeah, that's, that's right. And she pays them the 100000 and they go, cool, I'm glad that we worked this out. And as he goes to leave, she says, that money's for my two kids. And Ginzo and the doctor are freaking out because they're like, why would you do that? And she's like, I can never abandon these kids. I love them so much that even if it cost me my life, I will never lie and say that these were not my kids. I love them too much for that. And Nami and Najiko rush out from the forest where they've been hiding, and they have this very emotional, uh, this very emotionally charged meeting where they hug her and it's, Nami apologizes, and you know they're crying and they're so upset. And because she doesn't have enough money to pay, Arlong pulls her aside and shoots her point blank. And the last words she says to Najiko and Nami are, "I love you," and then she's killed. And they have this little flashback where Nami and Jiko remember like one of the things that Bellamere told them was to never lose the ability to smile because if you do, things will come around at some point. So as they're sitting there mourning the loss of their mother, Hachin, I, God, it's so hard to like him at this point because he's such a such a like a shithead in the past but he goes into the house again and he says oh this is where these ocean charts that we're looking for have been kept nami's like those aren't yours those are mine i drew those and he's like oh really well if you're such a good cartographer then we could use that so arlong goes to kidnap nami but the town tries to fight back against this and Genzo, uh, in this scuffle, is he's like sliced down, and that's why he has all those scars to this day, because he tried to stand up against Arlong in this moment. He also tried to do it earlier, that also did not go well for him. So he is cut all over his body, he is stitched up everywhere because of these scars, and he says that like, we paid you the money to, to protect her, you can't take her. And Arlong says, I'm not hurting her, I'm taking her with me, like she's going to do like a job for me but she's going to be safe so while this is happening like the, the whole town is like trying to rescue her and they're getting hurt and nami says tells them to stop because like she's already like someone else has already died because of her and like she doesn't want anyone else to get hurt and that she'll she'll save them but like if if they just like let arlong take her so then nami comes back later and the town is like getting ready to rebel again but she says like don't do that they paid me they paid me money 
and that I'm joining their crew as their navigator and their cartographer, and that she also now has this tattoo on her arm of the Arlong Pirates. She's a pirate now, and Najiko like tries to knock, knock, knock some sense into her, but Nami tells her that like she's tired of being decent. That's what Bellamere was, and that got her killed. So she'll do whatever she needs to, to to stay alive and be on top in this new world. Genzo tells her to leave and never come back, but when Jiko goes back to her home later, she finds Nami at Bellamere's grave and reveals that she made this deal with Arlong to get the village back for, for 100 million berries, and since no one will come and rescue them, She'll do it herself, and she will never cry again, and that she will only smile because once you smile, good things come. And so, in the present, Genzo leads Nozumi to Tsunajiko's house, where Nami is there. And Nozumi reveals that because the treasure that she has been stealing over the last eight years was stolen in the first place, it belongs to the government because they need to reimburse people who it was stolen from in the like to begin with and so now they're going to confiscate it and so they start searching through the tangerine trees nami quickly realizes that nozumi is working with arlong and they eventually do find the money and they confiscate it all however while this is happening genzo stands up for her and he reveals that he and everyone else in the village had known all along like, what her plan was and that they played along hoping for the day that she finally gets enough money to free them and hoping that they were doing the right thing even though like they did not like the idea of like letting this child go with Arlong. And so there's also this comment in here, you'll come here and let Arlong just do his thing but you'll confiscate from a petty thief. Like that's what you can do. And this is like one of the earliest critiques of the world government that we, we see from Oda. Like, they are not on the side of justice normally. Um, they are on the side of whatever is easier for them to do, which in this case is to not attack the fishmen and to just steal money from Nami and, and bring it back to Arlong. And so Nami is like freaking out and she rushes back to Arlong Park, um, partially also because Nozumi and his crew shot Najiko. So she's very angry at this point, like shot her in the stomach. So she is like very angry that they've not only hurt her sister, but also, like, gone back on his deal um, and stolen the money um, from her. So Arlong basically tells her to, like, screw off, that, like, he hasn't broken his deal, that, like, she doesn't have the money, and so, like, start over. And she goes back into town where the villagers are, like, basically about to start another rebellion. Like, they've had it. They're like, cool, we're just going to finally end this. This is too much for us. They're ready to die at this point. And Nami goes to try to stop him and stop the village, but Ginzo consoles her and basically says that like it's it's their turn to protect her now, and that they're tired of like letting her handle this by herself. That they'll they'll finally stand up for her. And this is where we get probably one of the most iconic scenes in One Piece altogether, which is Nami on the ground crying. So she's already broken her promise that she'll never cry again. She's crying. And she's stabbing her own tattoo of the Arlong Jolly Roger because she doesn't want anything to do with Arlong anymore. And she's ashamed that she ever wore it. So she's just stabbing her arm over and over and over again. And Luffy, he comes up and he grabs her arm and he stops her. And, and Nami looks up at Luffy and says, help. Luffy just takes his hat, puts it on her, and he gathers up. Sanji, Zoro, and Usopp, who finally say, finally, let's go to Arlong Park, and they do this very iconic walk. So, first, I want to say, with the Nami scene, I cried, okay? I cried when watching it originally, long ago, and I cried while reading it again. It was really sad. There was this one line where, like, she's stabbing her arm, and Luffy stops her, and she gets mad at Luffy. She's like, you don't know anything. I told you to leave. She like throws dirt at him. And Luffy's like, yeah, I don't know anything. And you did tell me to leave. And then she just breaks down and starts crying and says, help me. And he just puts that straw hat on her. It was just so... And in this moment, Nami has a flashback to Luffy talking about this hat being his greatest treasure. And she realizes in this moment that Luffy trusts her to take care of his treasure while he goes to deal with her problem. He just yells, of course, I'll help you. And he just walks and then pulls up on the crew. The crew's all just sitting, waiting for him. And then they all walk to Arlong Park. Once again, like you said, it was one of the most iconic parts of the anime. It's just such a really cool scene. 
It is. It's also, it's good because it shows us the loyalty of the crew because everyone, including Usopp, is like, let's go. They don't even say a word. They're just like, let's go. So the villagers are also going to Arlong Park at the same time that Luffy and the crew are doing. But when the villagers arrive at Arlong Park, Johnny and Yasako are guarding it because they had overheard Najiko's story earlier and realized that they were wrong about Nami and that they should have trusted her before. And they said that they basically tell the villagers that they're not strong enough to deal with the fishmen and that they're waiting on a certain crew to show up. And just like that, Luffy punches through a fucking wall. He punches right through the wall of Arlong Park and he walks in and he's like, which one of you motherfuckers is Arlong? And Arlong is like, who the fuck are you? And Luffy just walks up to him and socks him in the face. And he's like, you made our navigator cry. And Sanji and the crew just follow up behind him. At this point, like, Hachin calls for the giant sea cow to attack Luffy and the crew. But when it pulls up, it takes one look at Luffy and Sanji and then it just starts to swim away. But then Arlong is like, get back here and attack him. And the sea beast is more afraid of Arlong than it is of Luffy and Sanji. So it tries to attack him. But Luffy's like, I don't have time for this. And he grabs the sea cow by its horns, stretches his arms and just flings it around everywhere and tosses it into the air. It gets the Team Rocket Star as it's launched into the stratosphere. And this basically just wipes out all the fodder instantly. The only ones who are really left are the commanders of Arlong's crew, which are Hachin, Chu, which is a... Uh, There's a Pokemon like it in like Gen 7 or Gen 8 or whatever. It's, it's like a fish with like really long lips. Yeah, big lips. He has big. He looks like a model, but he has like big lips. And then Harubi, which was the Ray Fishman. And then, of course, Arlong's there and he's geared up to fight as well. So this sets up Straw Hats versus the Arlong Pirates. So unfortunately, when Luffy grabbed the sea cow and threw it, he got his leg stuck in the ground. So he tries to attack Arlong, but Arlong just kind of picks him up with his leg still in a chunk of stone and just tosses him into the sea, which because he's a devil fruit user is basically a KO. He's going to drown and die. Although as Arlong points out in this moment, it doesn't even matter because he's going to drown anyway. Exactly. He's going to be swimming with the fishes as they say, right? Usopp at this moment, he attacks Chu with the fire star and this draws his attention and Usopp just dips. He, he runs into the woods with Chu chasing him because he's pissed that he got hit with an attack. Zoro starts attacking Hachin while Sanji is fighting Hirobi. At this point, Zoro is kind of starting to succumb to his wounds. He took fighting Mihawk. He's in bad shape and he only has one sword at this point. And Hachin mentions that he kind of wanted to see his three sword style, but Zoro is basically dying, right? His wounds are opening up and he yells for Johnny and y Yosuke to toss him in their swords, which they do. So now Zoro has three swords and he's ready to go. So as he prepares to fight Hachin, it turns out because he's an octopus, he practices six sword style. So it's six sword style versus three sword style. And Hachin mentions is like, this should be mathematically a win for me, right? Just do the math. And Zoro's like, y you don't know nothing, buddy. So Hachin swings his, his six swords in a flurry and Zoro blocks and dodges all of them. Um, and he hits him with the strike. This just pisses Hachin off even more. And he sends another flurry of strikes. And as Zoro's blocking, he like headbutts him in his wounds, right? Which is really cheap. Um, but that really hurts Zoro and he's reeling in pain, but he doesn't fall because he remembers the promise he made to Mihawk and Luffy that he can't fail until he gets a chance to fight Mihawk again. So he's just tanking all of this pain that he's been through in the previous fight and the fight now. And so Hachin prepares to like finish him off. Like he prepares a final strike with his swords and he flings himself at Zoro and Zoro breaks every single one of his swords in one strike. This doesn't stop Hachin because even though he's disarmed, he starts doing a flurry of punches like Jojo 
He's like, well, motor, 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 motor. And Zoro just responds with two of his name techniques, uh, Onigiri and Dragon Twister, which finally finishes off Hachin. So we cut to Sanji and his battle, right? Sanji's facing Hirobi, the Ray Fishman and he's kicked by him because he's a practitioner of fisherman karate. He's kicked by him and he's flung way back. Hirobi mentions that he's a 40th degree black belt in fisherman karate and Sanji's like, well, if that was 40th degree, then Zeph's kicks were must have been 400th degree. So Sanji decides like, what's more important, fighting this Harobi dude or saving Luffy. And Zoro's incapacitated basically from the fight, so he decides to go save Luffy instead, right? So he hops in the water and starts swimming down to try to get to Luffy. Harobi tells him that this was a mistake and that fishmen are way stronger in water than they are on land. So Harobi goes and jumps in after him. Sanji sees Genzo and Nojiko at the bottom of the seafloor and they're trying to free Luffy. Before he can get to them to help though, he's ruthlessly attacked by Harubi. And since he's a ray fishman, he I think he has like even more increased speed underwater. Like he's super fast under the sea, right? And he starts clotheslining Sanji from just different directions, just over and over again. Um, this is like forcing air out of Sanji's lungs. Right, every hit he gets hit, air is just being forced out of his lungs. Um, and Sanji's trying to fight back, but because they're underwater, his kicks are slower. Right, so not only is Hirobi faster underwater, but Sanji is slower underwater. Right, um, Hirobi's just giving Sanji the business um, until he decides, you know what, it's time to finish him off. Um, so he grabs Sanji. Uh, who's trying to escape to the surface to get some air and he does this move where he rapidly dives to the bottom hurting Sanji because of the change in like pressure he dives so fast that Sanji's body is like blowing up from the inside it's like reverse bends I think it's also the thing that got those rich people killed in that submarine that they made <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> right so yes. <laughs> too much too far I, I was not expecting that in this episode but yeah go ahead this doesn't kill sanji but like it hurts him a lot and hirobi's kind of surprised that he's still alive after he did this much unlike those rich people in that submarine um so he decides to do it again right <laughs> He decides to do it again. He brings Sanji closer to the surface to dive bomb with him again. But because now they're close to the surface, Sanji decides it's his time to act. And he forces the remaining air in his lungs into Hirobi's gills. And because he's a fishman, this hurts uh, fish like having air in, in their gills. Um, so Hirobi lets him go and Sanji's able to swim to the, to the surface and get air and he hops out and Hirobi he recovers from getting air blown in his gills and he also hops out the water but now they're on land right it's no longer the uh Hirobi's home field advantage in the sea they're on land and Sanji can whoop some ass on land right so Sanji starts to land several devastating kicks on Hirobi and basically knocks him out so now that's Hirobi down. So there's one more, the commanders, and that's Chu. Usopp, he's been running from Chu for a while now, and he's ran into a forest. He decides that his days of running away and playing pretend pirate are over, and he needs to man up and face Chu. So he does this, like he turns around and tries to fight Chu, and Chu just beats the absolute shit out of him. Like he's just too fast for Usopp to really handle. However, Usopp does manage to throw a bottle of alcohol at Chu, who he just casually catches. Um, but as he catches it, Usopp loads around and strikes it, splashing alcohol all over Chu, right? This pisses Chu off considerably. And so he goes to like a nearby lake and he drinks water 
and he basically uses the water to essentially fire water bullets at Usopp, right? And it's like cutting trees down. That's how powerful these bullets are. And Usopp's just like running through the trees trying to take cover. Um, and in a moment of heroism, he tells True that, you, you know what? Grog burns, right? Did you know that? And he shoots him with a fire star, igniting the alcohol on Chu's body, setting him up in flames. And Chu, on fire, desperately tries to run to the lake to like uh, douse himself with water. But before he could get there, Usopp intercepts him and just hits him with the hammer over and over and over again. He does not stop hitting him with the hammer until Chu stops moving, until this man stops moving. Let's make it clear, it's a, like, like a rubber mallet, not a claw hammer. He's not bashing his brains in, he's just like <laughs> rattling his head around a little bit. He might as well be. He might as well be. If you get hit, it's death by a thousand cuts, right? If he, <laughs> you get hit enough times. He hits him until he, he at least stops moving, and with that, he collapses finally won his first major battle at sea. However, it's kind of funny to note here that because he ran into the woods, nobody saw his bravery. I think Oda did that on purpose. So we cut to Nami. She decides to confront Arlong. Um, so she takes her staff and she runs to Arlong Park. Once she gets there, she tells Arlong that she's come to kill him. Arlong laughs this off and says that she'll be his cartographer forever, right? And that she has two choices. She can either join his crew and he'll spare the villagers, but kill Sanji and Zoro who tried to fight him and failed, or she can stick with them, stick with them being the villagers and Sanji and Usopp and everyone and fight him and fail. And he asks Nami, whose crew do you belong to, mine or theirs? and she turns to the villagers who are still outside the gate, like afraid to run in because they've seen all this craziness going on. And with a smile on her face, she asked them to please fight and die with her, which was a hard ass line, I'm not gonna lie to you. She does it with a smile too. She's like, please, let's fight and die guys. And the villagers, they literally yell, hooray! They yell it at the chance to, you know, fight and die. Finally, after all these years of like letting Arlong step on him, they have the chance to fight. Meanwhile, Luffy, he gets revived. Genzo had stretched Luffy's neck and head onto dry land. So he's sitting there with like Luffy's head in his lap and his neck um, stretched and his body's still at the bottom of the sea, right? And Nojiko was basically pumping his chest to get the water out um, and she finally managed to do it long enough that he spits like a giant stream of water into the air and as he revives Zoro and Sanji see the giant spit of water and they're like okay Luffy's back basically and they use this as a signal to get ready to help free Luffy Zoro tells Sanji that he can only last 30 seconds like he gets back up and he's like dying still and he's like hey man I can only I can only hold off Arlong for 30 seconds and Sanji's like that'll be plenty and he jumps into the sea to free Luffy. Really quick I want to point out that this is an interesting moment because um, Ginzo before this happens Ginzo asks Luffy now that he's conscious can he break the thing that uh, his feet are enclosed in and he says no I'm too weak. And this is an interesting point to make because up to this point, we have only heard that Devil Fruit users cannot swim. And I think this is the first time that we really get an idea that it's not so much that they cannot swim, it's that the water physically weakens them. Um, and it also negates their powers, although if you have a permanent modification to your body like Luffy, where his body is made of rubber, that is still active, which is why someone else can pull his head out, but he can't use his own powers inside the water. And he's also extremely weak when he's inside the water. Yep. And it was kind of funny because the first thing he did, or first thing he like said when he was revived and like Ginzo was there, he was like, uh, where's your propeller? Like, it was just a dumb Luffy thing. He's like, so Sanji's like, he jumps into the water to free Luffy. 
and Hachin, after being distracted by Usopp, jumps in after him. So Usopp distracting Hachin gives him gives Sanji like a few seconds of a head start. Zoro attacks Arlong with his swords, but he just blocks it with his nose. And Arlong says like his nose is unbreakable and he grabs Zoro by the neck and like lifts him up. But he's shocked. He, like he, he lifts him up and he sees him all bloodied and he's shocked at the extent of his wounds. Like Zoro's shirt opens up and there's just a giant slash across his chest and it's like poorly stitched up, right? And he's bleeding profusely. Arlong's like, dog, you should be dead. Like, you should not be alive right now. You shouldn't even be fighting. You should be dead. And Zoro just smiles saying that, you know, maybe if he stayed lying down, his wounds wouldn't have opened. Arlong's like, hey, bro, it's way, it's way past that, buddy. Like, <laughs> I don't think lying down, even lying down will help you. And Zoro replies like, I'm not talking about me. Cut to Hachi. Hachin. He's dived in the water after Sanji. And just before he could get to him, his wounds from the fight with Zoro just burst open, incapacitating him and giving Sanji time to kick the bit of rock that's keeping Luffy's leg or keeping Luffy uh, trapped underwater. He kicks it and breaks it. And now Luffy is free. Luffy's body snaps back because he's been stretched so far. He's he's literally at the bottom of the seafloor basically to dry land. So his body snaps back and with the toss from Ginzo, Luffy sent flying into the air way above Arlong Park. And Luffy yells out, I'm free! And he's like all happy. Um, Luffy basically on his way down grabs Zoro midair and tosses him back while going for a headbutt on Arlong and he he hits Arlong basically with every named attack he has just in one one page he just goes da 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 every named attack you've seen in the series so far Arlong is not phased at all he does not give a fuck right and he's like is that all you've got and Luffy's like nah I'm just warming up and he starts doing some stretches you know, um, Arlong starts to swing at Luffy, uh, but Luffy keeps dodging. You know, he even there was one strike where like Arlong goes to swing at Luffy, and Luffy has to pull his own neck out the way uh, of like getting, or it wasn't a swing, it was a bite. Like Arlong went to bite him, and he just pulls his own neck out the way, like a Looney Tunes character. Um, so the whole time Arlong is like fighting Luffy, he's going on this spiel about how fishmen are superior to humans and that humans are useless and weak and what can they do? And Luffy does not give a fuck. Like he grabs a sword that's laying on the ground and he swings at Arlong who naturally like bites down with his super sharp and strong teeth to crush it. And right as he does this, Luffy uses this moment, uh, this moment to punch him square in the jaw, shattering his teeth, right? <clears throat> so I think it's important to note here. So like uh, Arlong went on this whole spiel about like humans are useless and weak. And Luffy yells at Arlong. He's like, I don't know how to use a sword. I don't know how to navigate. I don't know how to cook. I don't even know how to tell lies, you know, but I can't, I know I can't live without help from many people. And this line, like, made me feel certain ways, Britt, like. I also love he, when, because Arlong immediately follows up with, you lack the slightest shred of dignity or ability. What gives you the right to be a, a captain of a ship? Just what can you do? And Luffy just goes, I can beat you. It just goes to show that Luffy has already seen everyone in his crew as, like, his family. It also really ties into his flashback with Nami, where Bellamy tells her, like, it doesn't matter if you're related, you're still family. Um, and, like, that's what Luffy's crew is, they're family. At this point, Arlong, after having his teeth shattered, 
he regrows his teeth because apparently that's a thing sharks can do. It's real. So Arlong regrows his teeth and then he takes them out twice. So now he has two sets of his teeth in his hands and one set of teeth in his mouth, right? And he uses this to like bite in quotes Luffy like with his hands he he's like swinging at Luffy trying to bite him with his hands right um he 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 manages to catch Luffy and it like hurts him and is really painful and then he uses his real mouth and teeth to bite down on Luffy's arm and Luffy just uses this opportunity to smash Arlong in the ground now that he was like attached to him Right, he slams him into the ground doing massive damage. Um, after some back and forth that entails like Luffy stretching his fingers into a net to try to catch Arlong, uh, Arlong kind of gets sick of fighting a Looney Tunes character and he sticks his hand through this wall and he pulls out this giant shark sword. Um, and he hits Luffy with it and it sends him into a particular room, right? The room is covered with maps and Arlong tells Luffy that Nami is a genius, right? And he will use her and her map drawing skills to conquer the East Blue, right? And Luffy just stares down at this blood-soaked pen, which has obviously was Nami's that she used to like draw all of these maps while she was stuck in this room, right? And as Arlong goes to swing at him with the giant ass tooth sword, shark tooth sword, he grabs the end of it, right? He grabs the blade and he's pissed at this point because Arlong said something fucked up. He used one word that really pissed Luffy off. He said he was going to use Nami, right? And this sends Luffy into berserk mode, right? Like, Arlong can't even break. Like, Arlong couldn't break free of the grip that Luffy had on his blade once he realized what Arlong had said about using Nami. So, like, Luffy starts to go berserk and he's destroying the room that's full of maps, right? A single table falls from the tower that they're in and Nami sees it. Nami who's on the outside, she sees it and like she starts to cry and she's like, thank you. And maps are like falling from the sky. There's just a flurry of maps and and pens and desks and tables and stuff and Luffy says I don't cre I don't care how great fishmen are I don't care about sea charts none of this means anything to me but I figured out a way to save her the problem has been this room she hated being stuck here so long so I'm going to destroy it right and he's just tearing everything apart at this moment he stretches his leg up, way up through the roof of this giant tower that they're in, um, all the way up to the sky and the clouds, right? And Arlong, seeing a moment to attack, he turns himself into like a drill, basically, and he lunges at Luffy. And he manages to hit Luffy, but the second he's hit, Luffy's foot comes down from the sky and his foot comes down literally, right? It, literally the foot, the shoe drops, right? And the force of this blow, because he stretched so far, smashes him through the tower and collapses it in the process, right? And at this point, Arlong is defeated. He's he's done for. 
And so as the dust clears, Arlong lays there defeated, and Luffy stands on top of the rubble, um, and he tells Nami that she is one of the Straw Hats now, and she cries and just says, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah. And at this time, Nizumi shows up, the little rat-faced motherfucker from earlier, and he tries to take all of Arlong's treasure, basically saying that, like, oh, thank you for doing this, um, but we're here to confiscate it all now. But uh, Zoro, like, grabs him and, like, throws him on the ground, and then Nami just beats the shit out of him with her bow staff, like, knocks him senseless, and basically says that, uh, you're not going to take this money, this belongs to the people of this village, you're going to arrest Arlong because that's your fucking job, and you're gonna give me back my money that you stole from me. And he basically threatens that something bad happened to them, but they don't really care. They just, like, they get him to arrest Arlong and put him back on the ship, where on the ship, he calls Marine HQ, and he demands that the Straw Hats be considered a dangerous crew, Luffy and his four commanders, and that Luffy be given a bounty. We won't know what that bounty is until uh, a little bit from now, but I want to talk about this for a second, because this is the first time we see Din Din Mushi. So, this is a world that is set approximately in the, like, 17th century-ish, like the Golden Age of Piracy, like we talked about in our episode with Captain Marrow, if you've listened to that. However, there are some modern day technologies in this world. The first of that is that they're all just like straight up like pictures, like there are cameras, like they think I wanted poster of Luffy that is a picture, like a photograph. Um, they also have Din Din Mushis, which are these like little snails. You can outfit them with transponders and communicate between people. Um, and they also have this very cute thing of, like, they will mimic either their owner or whoever they're speaking to, depending on how they feel, essentially. They're very funny and cute, but, so there is, like, long-range communication in One Piece. So, that is, that'll come to rest, uh, roost at some point, but, uh, back at Coco Village, um, we kind of go through a bunch of different characters and see what's happening in this village now that Orlong is defeated. So first off, the doctor, he's stitching up. Uh, Zoro's wounds and he asks if there's a doctor on board and Luffy's like oh it's a really good idea but we should get a musician first um, and they're like Luffy and why this musician, man. dude he's obsessed with this musician but he does point out he does comment that having a doctor would be um, a very smart idea and uh, also at the same doctor's office Nami is there um, for being treated for her self-inflicted uh, stab wound earlier on the on the tattoo and she points out or she asked the doctor like will it ever will the scar ever go away he says no it'll ever it won't really go away and the tattoo that's still there really won't go away either you have to like cover it up and so he asked her to um i'm sorry she asked him to give her a new tattoo and we also get an interesting flashback of najiko when they were kids because she now has a tattoo which is like of uh, like a pinwheel type situation and she got it because Nami had the Arlong tattoo and she wanted to make Nami feel a little less alone in the world so she got the tattoo and so um, we find that that Najiko is just a great sister all around uh, which was I don't think was up for debate but uh, she's she's very very sweet so um well, after they get all stitched up and fixed up, they have a giant party on Coco Village, which is a theme we will see time immemorial from here on out. With, with That's not how that phrase is used, but I don't care. They will do this again and again and again in One Piece. Every time they beat a major villain, they have a party. Luffy loves this shit. Um, that's why he needs a musician. That's why he needs party. a musician. They, they gotta sing. They gotta dance. So... I, this is really funny scene. I did not realize this. Usopp is standing on the tower, telling stories of his like of his adventure, like taking down Chu. And there's a crowd gathering him. They're like, "Ooh, yeah, go Usopp, go Usopp," um, which is very funny. I didn't realize he had a, like an audience this early on. Um, so he finally got to tell people. About he finally it. got to tell, and and they're not lies this time. Um, although although he might be embellishing it a little bit, but. So then, um, Luffy, like, storms off to find some more meat that he, he really liked, um, but then at Bellamere's grave, Ginzo, he pours one out for Bellamere, and he tells her, and it's very, oh my god, it's such a sad scene, tells her that her daughters have grown up to be very strong and wonderful women, and it's almost like seeing her alive again, and that from here on out, um, they're going to live their lives to the fullest and smile whenever they can. Luffy accidentally drops in on this eulogy 
um, and it's like conversation. And really all Genzo has to say is, Nami's joining your crew now and you're going to dangerous places and that's fine. I trust you to take care of her, but do not do anything that will make her unhappy or I will kill you. Um, such a dad thing to say. Luffy's like, yes sir, yes sir, I, I will not hurt your daughter, please. I will, not, I will make her happy. Um, and so the party kind of ends and then the next morning as they are getting ready to leave, they're like, where's Nami at? She's missing. Uh, very, one of the, this keeps happening, like, the crew member they're, they're adopting is just, like, stayed behind. Um, and so, we hear her, like, running through town, she's yelling, like, lower the sails, lower the sails, get going. And so they're like, alright, so they start going, and then as she runs through the town, everyone's like, no, you don't, like, you don't get to run away without saying goodbye to us. And she runs up through, um the village and just jumps straight onto the boat as it's as it's leaving and she reveals that as she worked her way through the crowd she stole all of their wallets but this is like very much like Surt village and baratier where it's like these villagers are angry at her um because she's kind of this rascally scamp but then they're like please come back we miss you we love you thank you for everything you've done for us um we really appreciate you and we and, and we're gonna miss you um and then the doctor um, hands the uh, talks to Genzo, and he reveals to her what reveals to Genzo what Nami's tattoo was. While Genzo is looking this over, he remembers meeting Nami and and Ajiko for the first time, and Nami kept crying because he had such a scary looking face, and so he put a, win a pinwheel on his hat to make her laugh as a baby, and that's why he has the pinwheel. It's for Nami and so Najiko asks him where is his pinwheel at and he and we cut back to Bellamere's grave and um, he says oh I don't need it anymore I, th I think it'll be fine and he and he has put it on her grave on Bellamere's grave because he no longer needs to take care of Nami that's she's taking care of herself you know what's funny so he put the pinwheel on this hat to amuse baby Nami and Luffy, when he was revived, got the same amount of amusement, I feel like, from the pinwheel. He was like, hey, man, where's your pinwheel? He also may have, like, realized how important it was and been like, hey, where's yeah, that? Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but now that Nami is officially part of their crew, they finally have a navigator. Uh, the Straw Hats sail off into the Grand Line, where we will see them on the next episode. They are headed towards the Grand Line. So that wraps up the Arlong Park arc, uh, one of the, like I said, one of the uh, big major arcs of One Piece, the one that like really looks the most like a modern One Piece arc. This is the first one where you go, oh, okay, I, I see it all. The blueprint is there. Um, it's very moving and very touching. I think it also helps that like we've seen Nami. Like, it's one thing to have this character show up with this, all, this tragic backstory. It's another thing when we spent time with them and we've got to know them. And then we get their story and you realize like it recontextualizes everything beforehand and like it just adds this huge depth to this character instead of just like creating a character with depth. That's a good point. This is like one of the first instances of Goda <laughs> where you can go back and read and see all the little things that he did to... It's like you've been pointing out this whole time like every time Luffy and them do something it makes her question what it means to be a pirate. Um, and we see that now that like it's because she is a pirate and she knows pirates and she and she doesn't really like them, and also that like the scene with the hat is like her like it, every time the hat is damaged or referenced like she she like gains a respect for Luffy because he cares about something outside of just money and then like in that moment he gives her the hat to to protect uh, because she because he trusts her uh, and it, it like it just works so well. Um, and I mean, I love I love Zoro and Sanji and Usopp. I think they're cool characters, but they don't have that depth. Um, and we'll see. I think one other character like that. But uh, I mean, I would say every other Straw Hat when they join has a great introduction. Like I'm not saying like they're bad. It's just that I think Nami's is like one of the better ones because of we got that the time, time with put her into it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so now that we're here let's answer our question of the day. Um, so this comes from my friend Jason who asked us, 
uh, basically to talk about the geography of the One Piece world and how it is different from our world. So I want to, before, before we like answer the question, I want to establish something about the One Piece world that we know for a fact, which is that there are no major continents in One Piece. There's the Red Line, which is a giant mountainous continent. It's like one giant ring of land. Um, but aside from that, every it's other... All islands. It's all islands. There's not like, you know, like a huge, like Australia even. They're like, they're all pretty tiny continents. So it's a perfect world for sailing. Um, now, with that said, there are some theories about the world of One Piece, like the geography of it. And there are also some interesting things that we've seen. I want to let you talk about it first before I, I give my opinion on this. Okay. Like I said before, it's all islands, right? Like was mentioned before, it's all islands. And every island has its own weather patterns and its own, like, what's the word? Not genome, but like uh, biome, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, so there are like winter islands and spring islands and summer islands and fall island islands, stuff like that. Um, and because the world is full of islands, uh, you kind of have to navigate it by using maps or another thing we come to later. Uh, sh can that's I spoil? That's, that's next or, episode, no? so I mean, like, we uh, can... Okay, so... Yeah, so there, each island has a magnetic sense to it and there's a mm -hmm. way to measure that so that's that's one of the, especially in the grand line that's one of the uh that's one of the best ways to to navigate it's really in some ways the only way it's, to navigate and it's a great way to like it's a great thing in story but outside of the story it's just genius by oda because to navigate you have to go to the island to like you know set your course yeah, to the next one right so it gives an excuse in world for the crew to go to an island and stay there for a little bit right and have an right. adventure or go right? somewhere that they hadn't really planned on because they have to go there exactly yeah the other the other thing i want to talk about is that like there are some theories that the world of one piece is like incredibly large compared to our world um because like there are these enormous ships like humongous ships that seem to be like pretty small in comparison to like the world at large i don't necessarily know if that is the case i think um there's just so many islands that like there's more room for like gigantic ships you know what i mean um but it is constantly something people talk about is like how big the world one piece is and i, I actually there's not really I mean, I guess you can say, like, a lot of the humans, like, when we went later on, are, like, also pretty big. Like, there are literal giants in this world. Uh, we've seen the fishmen are, like, eight, you know, between, like, eight and ten feet tall, depending on who you're talking to. Like, so, there's something weird about this world in that regard. Um, and then also, based on stuff we've seen in, like, the most recent chapters, like, I'm talking, like, current, current chapters, it, there, <sighs> It might not even be that the world of One Piece is just set up for islands and sailing because that's what Oda wanted, but it, it may be like it, it may be a consequence of some stuff. Like we, yeah. I'm not even trying to be. I'm trying to be a little vague, but like we generally just don't even know that yet. Um, but it is possible that like this world was like ours with like major land continents, and that some stuff happened that caused the levels to rise the way they have. Um, so, like, it's possible that, like, how waterlogged this world is is not natural. But we don't know. So. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Not yet. But it is cool about the seasons. It also lets Oda, like, kind of, like, draw whatever he wants to draw. Um, yeah. That's the, that's the cool part for me is that he gets to literally do any genre of fiction he wants because he can just create an island for it and say, oh, this island is uh has a volcano and there's dinosaurs and stuff on it like <laughs> this island has robots like i don't know yeah it, it's really cool as yeah, a narrative I, tool i i agree yeah so the world so the world of one piece is is very interesting uh, like the physical world itself so if you have a question um wherever you're listening to this at or if you're on social media just uh 
leave us a comment. It can be about something you want to know about, something you want us to like investigate. Um, yeah, if you have a question about One Piece, just let us know. Um, and with that, I think we are done. So if you want to find us on social media, uh, at the podcast is at Some Peace Pod on everywhere you'll find us on social media. And I am at Sunny Girl L Y K on social media. And I am at Emperor Zone on X slash Twitter. X slash Twitter. I'm not calling yeah. it X. <laughs> I, don't <care. laughs> I don't care. It's still Twitter. Um, anyway, thank you all for listening, and we will catch you next time. See you.